Hadija Niazi was an 11-year-old girl who lived in Pakistan. And she loved to learn. Every day when she got home from school, she would get on the family computer and scour the internet, trying to find things for her to learn and get more information about. As she would look on the internet, she would find different websites with different topics. She would find videos that she could learn from. And eventually, she came across a website called Udacity. Now, Udacity was a website that contained a lot of massive open online courses known as MOOCs. And she decided to enroll in one of the free MOOCs that Udacity offered. And at 11 years old, she enrolled in one that was aimed at college freshmen, and it was physics. And she loved it. At 11 years old, she plowed through this physics class, devoted a lot of her time to it. She would get on the Udacity forums and ask for help when she needed it. She would request assistance from her parents, from her normal teacher at school. And she did exceptionally well. She actually did quite a bit better than some of the college freshmen that were taking it. And it came time for her to take the last unit, the final exam. And as with most things on Udacity's website, the final exam questions are delivered in video form. The professor would pose a question, and then the student would type their response. And as she began to take the sixth question of the final, the video stopped. In fact, all of the videos on Udacity had stopped working for Hadija. The Pakistani government had blocked YouTube, which was how Udacity delivered their videos. Now, when this happens, it's usually because some content has been uploaded that the government doesn't like or disagrees with. And their response, sometimes, is to block the entire website across the whole country. And that's what happened here. Usually when this happens, some geeks and engineers will make some circumvention methods, and it will kind of disseminate among the geeks and engineers, but it doesn't always reach the general public. And so, in this particular case, it wouldn't be that surprising that Khadija is unable to finish her course. So the internet's changed the way that education works. It's changed the way that teachers teach and students learn. As the internet began to be made available, universities experimented with putting their courses online. Stanford University started a partnership with Princeton and the University of Virginia. And they created Coursera, a place where MOOCs could be placed for each of those universities. So now if you go to Coursera, you can take any one of the classes from any of those three prestigious universities online for free. You won't get the degree but you can access the content. MIT did something very similar with their MIT open courseware. And as these universities begin placing content online, other places begin sprouting out that were not necessarily affiliated with traditional universities. Khan Academy, a place where you can go watch thousands of videos ranging from elementary school to graduate level courses. Code Academy, a little bit more targeted. You can go there and learn programming languages. And it was into this world of online education and content distribution that Sebastian Thrun stepped. Sebastian Thrun was a distinguished professor at Stanford who taught a class on artificial intelligence. And he decided that he wanted to work with his colleague, Peter Norvig, and place their artificial intelligence class online. So together, they created Udacity. And they decided that they wanted to do their online course a little bit different than other ones that they had seen. Before even beginning to start the idea of Udacity, they looked at other MOOCs that had artificial intelligence classes and saw the recurring theme of a professor lecturing for one hour into a camera. And they decided that they didn't want to do that. They wanted to change the product, not just the distribution method. Most things as they convert to the internet, you change the distribution method and that's how they get to the internet. 10 years ago, if you wanted to rent a movie, you might go down to Blockbuster. You'd buy a CD for music at Walmart. You'd purchase a book at Hastings. Now, you might watch the movie on Netflix. You might download the music from iTunes and buy the book on your Kindle. You get the same thing, you just get it differently. And that's what Sebastian wanted to avoid. 
He wanted to not only change the distribution method, but change the product. So after looking at those other classes offered online, he saw that the one hour video format wasn't working that well. It was too easy to multitask. You could minimize the video, keep checking your email, and then say you'd taken the class. So what he did was he split his class into short video segments. So each unit, instead of being an hour long video, were several videos of just a few minutes long. And every couple of videos, he would ask a question that was relatively easy, if you'd been paying attention, to make sure the students stayed engaged. And the students did stay engaged. They loved it. They thought that they were more engaged with him as a professor and more engaged with the content. But he kept soliciting feedback. And one of the things he found out was that students wanted unlimited tries at those questions. And so Sebastian realized that he was working too hard to grade every little aspect of his class. And so he modified the software to allow unlimited tries. And the students loved it. They felt even more engaged. They felt even better familiar with the content. And so what Sebastian was doing here is he was using a method known as teacher as a facilitator, something that had become common uh, in traditional classrooms as well as online, and that he was using in his Udacity class. Now with his Udacity class, he wanted to make it available to Stanford students as well as to the students that were taking it for free online. So that semester he came in and he told his class that if they wanted to stop coming to class and just go to Udacity, they could stop attending lectures. Perhaps unsurprisingly, three-fourths of his students stopped showing up to class. However, what was a little surprising was that semester, the midterm and final grades for his class for Stanford students were one full letter grade higher than any class previously. A little surprising. What was more surprising was that at the end of the semester, he ranked every student that had taken the Udacity course, and he had to go down 400 rankings to find someone with a Stanford email address. So using this teacher as a facilitator method, in addition to the MOOC interface, was really effective and engaging students that had no vested interest in a degree, but just were interested in artificial intelligence. So it was something really cool that he had found. In 2011, the journal Science released a research study done at the University of British Columbia. A prestigious professor there had his class split into two sections. One section was taught by him, as it always was. The other section was taught by inexperienced graduate students using methods developed by research into human cognition, the same types of teaching methods used by Udacity. In one week, the graduate students' class Scores on their week test had doubled and attendance had increased 20% because what they did was they split the class into small groups and let them work together to solve problems with occasional feedback from the instructor, this being opposed to the traditional lecture method. And so that works really well in the traditional classroom. And Sebastian found that it worked exceptionally well online. And one of the reasons that this is is because MOOCs combined with teacher as a facilitator methods, allow for niche learning. When I went to high school, we had electives. And it was the first time I'd ever been allowed to have a say in what classes I taught. So we had uh, marketing, computer programming in C++, shop, art, graphic design. It was some really cool stuff. And I was amazed that I actually got to pick what I did at school. It's crazy. But that pales in comparison to the amount of classes and the amount of information that I can access online. And that combined with a teacher's a facilitator method, a teacher at the school, allows me to truly experience an excellent education on a variety of topics in addition to what the school can offer. And so combining these methods with the international network of students allows for some truly amazing things. And that's what really takes education locally and online to the next level, is that international network of students. And that's what really changed the experience for Hadija. After Hadija was unable to access that video, unable to complete the final, unable to complete this physics course she'd spent a lot of time on, she posted her predicament on the Udacity forums. And the response was immediate and overwhelming. Within one hour 
a young man from Malaysia, also taking the course, began posting detailed summaries of each of the final questions so that Hadija could begin working on the answers. A young professor that was teaching physics in Portugal and was taking this class to research instruction methods began working on a circumvention method for Hadija to access YouTube. It didn't quite work immediately, but she kept in contact with Hadija working around the YouTube block. A young boy, 12 years old in England, also taking the class, reached out to Hadija and offered to help in any way he could. He also recommended that she not write anything particularly negative about her government online. <laughs> that evening, just a few hours after Hadija had posted her plea, the professor from Portugal had downloaded every single one of the Udacity videos, saved them, and re-uploaded them to a new website that was not blocked in Pakistan. The whole process took four hours to devote to a child half a world away. Khadija was able to access those videos, was able to complete the final, and posted her exuberance on the Udacity forums the next day. <laughs> so it was thanks to this international network of students that an 11-year-old girl was able to complete a physics class aimed at college freshmen. She worked with those students around the world. She worked with her teacher acting as a facilitator to enable her to do something that she wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. And these are stories that we're seeing more and more every day as the internet pervades the classroom as we know it. And this is what's been happening for the last 10 years, and it's getting more and more amazing. And I personally can't wait to see what's gonna happen in the next 10. So once again, my name's Eldridge. Thanks for coming out, and hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.